Hello, how's it going? Very well, I can hear you loud and clear. Uh, Boulder, Colorado is uh, again emerging into sunshine, one of our 300 uh, blue sky days equivalent of Southern California, so uh, it's very welcome after all this rain. I think they should. <laughs> Likewise. Mm hmm. Yes, hello. Sounds great. Let me just bring this up here. Um, well, firstly, thanks for the opportunity to be here with you all. And um, it's kind of fun to be saying uh, good afternoon, even though I only got up about an hour and a half ago. Um, one uh, very, uh, very quick caveat. I'm actually feeling slightly under the weather. So if, um, if at any point I, uh, I just use this to uh, wipe my eyes, it's because my eyes are slightly watery. It's, it's not because I'm kind of perspiring um, under the, the pressure or something. Um, I, well, it's funny you should say that I did. I was speaking with a friend earlier and he said, oh, maybe you're tearing up because you're feeling nostalgic. So it may, may, maybe that's true, but we'll see. Um, just a very quick uh, bit of, I guess, background from me so you have a sense of where I'm coming from. Um, I studied politics and psychology at Cambridge. I got very interested in something called positive psychology, um, which is how do we take the insights of psychology and instead of applying them to people that have or only applying them to people that have psychological problems like neurosis or psychosis, how can we use psychology just to make the average person's life better or to make the average person's life more flourishing or um, work more coherently? Um, I worked for a short time for Dale Carnegie. Um, how many of you have seen the film uh, How to Lose Friends and Alienate People? No? Okay, well that's a parody on a book written by Dale Carnegie in the 1920s in New York, uh, which was How to Win Friends and Influence People. Um, so Dale Carnegie runs a whole series of professional development trainings. And um, I then hooked up with a guy called Tony Robbins, who some of you may be aware of. Um, Tony Robbins is probably the biggest name in the personal growth industry. Um, has client list has included people like the ice hockey player Wayne Bretzky. He coached Agassi from when he was dropped out of the top 20, I think, in 91, 92, and brought him back to number one in a Wimbledon win. Um, apparently, Bill Clinton, on the night that he was impeached, called Tony Robbins and said, hey, what should I do? Um, to which I think Tony Robbins said, uh, you probably could have called me earlier. Um, uh, but uh, I, I was involved in some of the promotion of his London seminars. We used to get 12,000 people come and see him in the Excel Center in London. And um, he's um, one of the biggest fi figures, if you like, in the, in the area of empowerment, motivation, and uh, like leadership strategy. Um, and I decided that that information was really useful. And even though I'd had a really good run in the education system, always did fairly well academically, uh, no one had really talked to me about, you know, what are your dreams? How do you really make dreams happen? What's, um, what's the deepest expression of who you are and how can you manifest that in the world? And uh, I really thought it was important to ask those questions. So I, I started a social purpose business, Future Foundations, um, that runs personal development programs for teenagers. It was a very common experience on both the Dale Carnegie and Robin stuff for people to say, this is fantastic. Um, I wish I could have it for my son and daughter. Um, and that's uh, part of the gap that I was trying to fill with Future Foundations. And now, you know, I stepped out operationally two years ago. Future Foundations, I think this year, will have worked with just over 8,000 young people in uh, leadership, personal development, and uh, awareness programs. Um, so when I stepped out of that, really, I stepped out to ask a question, which is our title today, like, what... What is the cutting edge of human development? I'd been in and around the development space for quite a while, and um, I really took some time out, principally in America, to up-level my own understanding of like what are some of the further reaches of human development? Like once people get that their life is there, they have agency in their lives, because that's one of the biggest focuses of the personal development industry is to say, hey, don't be a victim, don't be a victim of your circumstance, don't be a victim of your education, don't blame your parents, don't blame your culture. If there's something that you really want to make happen, you need to take responsibility for that. And you start to notice that your life works a lot better when you operate from a place of uh, responsibility. Um, but beyond just taking responsibility for your life, there seems to be 
uh, a whole series of, of other paths uh, of development. And I came across this approach called integral development that I'm going to touch on a little bit later, um, which started to suggest that uh, each human being has different lines of development, which is to say that we have an emotional self, we have a cognitive self, we have a psychological self, we have a relational self, um, we have a moral self, and that, that all, all these aspects of us seem to unfold according to their own logic, which, which means to say, and you've probably met people like this, that you could be very cognitively developed, you could be incredibly intellectual, um, and emotionally or socially, you could be very undeveloped. You know, like bright people who don't say the right thing or who, you know, who are so bright that they can't really connect with other people. Um, and that's, um, that just made some kind of uh, intrinsic sense to me. So I, having spent a sabbatical in the US and now over here full time, um, I basically spent the best part of 18 months, two years just trying to find the best teachers I could. And in the personal growth space, a lot of them are in the US um, to kind of dig into these questions of, um, you know, how people can continue to develop themselves um, once they're aware that they can be like in their own driving seat. And that's the reason why my company now is called Full Spectrum Living, because I try and help people, leaders particularly, social entrepreneurs also, develop their capacities uh, across the, their full spectrum. So they're not just in their career, not just in their relationship, not just in their family life, but like really bringing a whole being perspective um, to, everything that they, uh, to everything that they do. Um, so that's a little bit of background where I'm coming from. I don't know if you could just roll the slide, Josh. Um, so I wanted just to, because it's the, the, the space that I'm in, I wanted just to say a few things um, about coaching and realizing that this is probably not something that um, you guys will be doing full time, but I do think it's one of the approaches to leadership that's uh, really important. Um, and if you haven't come across uh, his work, I'd, I'd recommend you have a look at Daniel Goleman. Uh, most people know him for his, his work on emotional intelligence, uh, but he wrote a book called Primal Leadership. And in that book, he talks about six different leadership styles, uh, one of which is the coaching style of leadership um, that he contrasts to the pace setting style of leadership. So pace setting leadership is, is kind of where you say to someone, well, uh, do this, but if you don't do it well enough or competently enough, I will probably step back in and do it myself. So people who are talented, and I'm guessing that a lot of you guys, if you've you know, been selected for a high potential leadership program, you probably are, there's sometimes a tendency to want to do things for other people because you know that you can do it quicker. Um, coaching is all about building, coaching leadership is all about building capacity in other people. So in the short term, it takes longer. But in the long term, if you develop that capacity in people, you have a better team and you have, you have you know, more capacity in the team as a whole. Um, I talk here about the three predicates of coaching. Um, I acknowledge James Flaherty, who's one of the founders of Integral Coaching um, for, for this. Um, and by predicates, I just mean what are some of the conditions that need to be in place for a coaching engagement or coaching relationship, whether that's with an employee, a colleague, uh, a son, a daughter, you know, whoever that might be. What are some of the conditions for that coaching relationship to work? Um, so the first one is probably sounds self-explanatory, um, that there needs to be a good uh, relationship in place. But what, what more specifically do I mean about that? Um, one of the things that for a good coaching relationship is then there needs to be good mutual listening. And by good mutual listening, uh, I mean the ability to create the sort of space that other people can talk into freely. And one of the things you notice when you coach people is that it's often what's important as much as what's being said as what's not being said. And so creating a space where things that aren't normally able to be said, um, either because they seem too threatening to that person or to you, um, to create a space where those things can be said is, is incredible incredibly powerful uh, and allows people in this whole person orientation to bring more of themselves um, to the table. Um, the other thing that's important in a coaching relationship is that you have a clear set of agreements uh, about what is being, what, you know, what is able to be said and what are the, what are the implications of that. You know, I come from a background when I was in the UK of working a lot with young people where we had to be really clear about disclosure um, because there were certain things that if they were disclosed had to be, uh, you know, passed on to the school and relevant authorities similar thing if you're coaching someone who's you know who you're managing you know what what are the implications of that where does that information go because it's important for people to know if they're talking to you kind of off the record or if they're talking to you in a context that might be um, fed back to other people um, and that's also a, a reason why it can be useful to have someone who's a who, who's a coach to you um, who's not your direct line manager 
because it, it, it opens a space up. So at Future Foundations, we, we had an external person who was a coach to most of our senior team um, because people knew that that was a completely safe space for them to talk into. It didn't, you know, it wouldn't affect who got promotions or who got what responsibilities. Um, so again, just being clear on what those kind of agreements are. Um, having trust in a relationship is really important. Um, having integrity about punctuality um, and having integrity about your in intention as well. Um, James Flaherty, who I mentioned, who's the, the founder of a company called New Ventures West, which is the largest trainer of integral coaches in the world. Um, he is incredibly keen on uh, kindness as part of a coaching relationship because uh, you know, as a coach, someone who's providing a space for someone else um, and who's also probably giving them feedback and suggestions about uh, you know, what it is that they're up to is a very powerful position. And oftentimes you, you find people who've got a lot of skills in the sense they can listen well and they can really see into other people and see maybe where their blind spots are or see where their weaknesses are. Um, but if that's not coming from a place of kindness, uh, it, can be, um, it can be kind of like skills not backed up in morality. So I think it's, um, it's really important that you set a strong intention um, and a kind of wholesome intention when you're working with someone in a coaching relationship. Uh, and lastly, an opening. Um, and by this, I mean an opening for a coaching conversation or a coaching kind of relationship to happen. And typically what this means is some kind of breakdown. Most of the time, people are uh, more open to coaching when there's something in their worldview or something in their way of being in the world isn't completely working. You know, like they used to, for example, a classic one in coaching is people who are successful, who think that life is about success, who think life's about climbing the ladder, making money, being a person of influence. And they, they do that and they get to a certain point, maybe they sell their company and they stick 20 million in the bank or something. And then they go, huh, so what's this really all about? And there's a new purpose that starts to emerge. And at that point, they might be more open to a conversation with someone that kind of discloses an, uh, some other orientations to being in the world. Um, or even if someone's like, you know, suddenly they have an issue with their boss and that they didn't have before. That may be an, an opening for coaching. It's generally to say that if there's not some kind of impulse or motivation coming from the coachee, it's really hard to have a coaching relationship. You know, I kind of joke about this. My, uh, my brother and I, we, you know, we get on very well. We're very differently cut. And he has um, very uh, little inclination to any sort of form of self-development. And uh, in his world, if anyone wanted a coach, it would probably be because they you know, kind of like needed help, almost like some kind of um, you know, psychologist or shrink. Um, so you, just, you need to be aware of what the level of openness the person that you're dealing with has to any kind of uh, you know, coaching relationship or feedback. Um, and I can even put that in my own context. I used to crunch 14-hour days without thinking about it when I was in London. Um, my, my, my business partner, John, used to joke that we'd spend 14 hours in the office together and then within uh, half an hour of his going home at 10 o'clock, he still got four texts about things that seemingly were so urgent that they couldn't have been dealt with in the previous 14 hours. Um, and, and then at a certain point, something just shifted and I, I, I didn't necessarily even want to go into the office. Um, so it's just... Uh, it's just noticing where someone is in their kind of cycle and uh, having an openness to coaching is, is, or some kind of coaching relationship is important. Any questions about that? Okay. How am I doing on pace? Because I know I'm talking quite fast. You okay? Okay. All right. So I'm going to flick the slide. Have you got that? F yep. So... Just I'll go through this pretty quickly. Qualities of good coaches as I see it. Uh, quality number one, deep listening. Uh, deep listening is the ability to hold a non-judgmental space for someone. Um, as I kind of alluded to earlier, I feel like in, in some of the more advanced edges of human development, um, rather than it being about trying to add something like building skills or building capacity, there's a certain part of development which is uh, in Jungian, Carl Jung in Jungian terms, is called integrating your shadow. And it basically means trying to reclaim the parts of yourself that you don't like to acknowledge are there or that you generally try and keep out of view. And Jung would say that there's, uh, you know, there's kind of like uh, psychic potential in those things. So if there's a part of yourself that's, um, well, let's say even in my own example, I'm generally an optimistic person. I'm generally a, a kind of smiley person. And I think often people kind of know me as that. So for me, it can sometimes be hard to be in touch with my sadness if I am ever feeling sad. Because at some level, I would think, well, I'm an optimistic person. So in my identity as an optimistic person, 
I don't think I really should be feeling sad. And I can do some kind of quick mental reframe to take any situation, look at the positives, and then make myself optimistic again. Um, but if you want the full expression of human experience, um, you know, sadness kind of goes with happiness. You know, if you want to have the full expression of uh, what, what a Beethoven symphony is about, then you need to be willing to feel the full emotions of a, of a human being. Um, so as a coach or even as a manager, being able to provide a space where people can bring into view the parts of themselves that they don't like to acknowledge can actually be incredibly developmental. Um, deep listening also means not reloading. Oftentimes when we're in conversation, what we're really doing is waiting for the next juncture that we can say something back to the other person, either give our opinion or, oh, that's just like a time when I, you know, it, like reflect back on some personal experience. And generally people know when that's the case. Deep listening requires that you, you put your full attention on the other person and you, you know, you may, you may pay attention to certain things that you, you, you feel, okay, that might be something to pick up on. But rather than thinking about what you're going to say next, you just put your full attention on the other person. And it, it also is combined with an ability to trust that if you do that, uh, you will you'll know what the right things are to say when the time is to say them. So it's much more of a of a trusting in this idea of presence, which I'll talk a little bit about. Tr trusting in um, your kind of intuitive response to people, rather than kind of having to overthink what it is you might say to them. So just just pay attention when you're having conversations. Am I really listening to this person, or am I reloading and focusing on what I'm gonna say next? Um, I've already talked a bit about uh, holding intention. Um, there's something very powerful about being a person who sees the highest potential in someone else. So for any of the people that you work with, your teams, your direct reports, uh, holding, an, holding a vision of their highest potential and holding a vision of them in their most powerful self um, can, alone can be a very powerful um, influence on other people. Um, and that's even harder when, you, when you're trying to talk to people about things that they're not doing super well or that you need them to be um, improving on. It can be hard to both do that and hold an intention where you really see this person in their highest light. In my experience, very few people see themselves regularly in their highest potential. So if you can be the person that does that for other people, um, it's incredibly powerful. Uh, and then the third thing I put here is doing your own work. Um, I think um, it's very hard to help someone with something that at some level you've not you've not kind of integrated in yourself so it's much easier to be um you know a, a person who can and teach a certain lesson if it's a lesson that you've had to learn perhaps struggle through yourself and that you've kind of come out on the other side so if uh, if people see that you are doing your own work and by that i mean things like noticing your own reactivity noticing when you react to a situation or a person and actually really inquiring into what's going on and actually really inquiring into whether that reaction is the only response that you could have. Or even noticing if you're reacting to a situation. Are you really reacting to that situation or are you reacting to some other situation, um, some other person that annoyed you in the past or some other thing that happened maybe in earlier life or childhood? Um, and, and actually noticing that. Because oftentimes we get triggered by things and we think this person has made me angry. Obviously, once you've been in the personal growth space for a while, you realize no one can make you angry, that there's always some kind of... Uh, choice to notice how you react to people so doing your own work means um really means becoming a mature human being um, and a mature human being at some level is more aware of why they really do what they do uh, is more aware of um their own blind spots and is willing to do some work about that you know as a you know my own example as a leader you know i was always able to do the vision thing but getting close enough to details of execution so that it happened well was harder for me. And at some level, you can outsource that stuff and build a team that are good at it, and that's not a bad thing to do if you're a visionary leader. Um, but organizations always benefit from having the attention of the leader or someone in a leadership position on certain things, even if it's not your forte. Um, so doing your own work means building the muscles of the things that you're not very good at. Doing your own work means looking at the trailing edges of your development and uh, being willing to kind of raise the floor on them. Uh, and oftentimes, most people around you are pretty aware of what the trailing edges, like the lagging edges of your development are. If people think that you are, you know, let's just say, emotionally unavailable, uh, most people around you will know that that's the case. If most people find that you're quick to anger, again, they probably know that about you. 
Um, and there's one way of being in the world which says, hey, I'm quick to anger. That's who I am. I'm uncomfortable with it. And there's another orientation that says, okay, I'm quick to anger. That's often how I show up in the world. And I'm also interested to see if I can start to show up in some other ways. Because being a, a full spectrum leader means you have more ability to respond to situations. You have more tools in your toolkit. You have more options about uh, how you respond to people. Uh, the analogy you could use here is golf clubs. You know, I'm not a golfer, um, but you know, in your average golf club, you've obviously got your woods, your irons, your wedges, your putters, and they, they're there for different purposes. And as a leader, if you're not able to select the right club for the right situation, then you are limited in your response. If you are only able to be directive towards other people, for example, and always telling them what to do, but never able to be consensual and democratic in your decision making, um, then you have a limited capacity as a leader. So I feel like a lot of the uh, like the, a lot of the ongoing qualities of a good coach are also the qualities of a good leader, uh, which is really kind of self-development. Any questions on that? Okay. Do you want to flick the slide? Okay. So three different types of conversation. Um, this doesn't have to relate to coaching. This is just generally useful um, as a way of being clear what the context is for a conversation that you're having with anyone. There's more than three types of conversation, but I list three here. Um, and sometimes if you, end, if you leave a meeting and you feel like, well, that didn't go super well, or I didn't feel like we're on the same page, it might be because you're holding different context for what you think that conversation is about. So just quickly, a conversation for action, kind of like it sounds, is a, a conversation where you're expecting set outcomes and between you, you're trying to coordinate some kind of action. So if you're having a planning meeting for an upcoming event and out of that planning meeting, you're looking to decide, you know, let's say the, the specific timings of, of an event, you're having a conversation for action. That is different than a conversation for possibility, which is really much more of a blue sky, brainstorm um, conversation where in effect anything is possible. And if... Uh, if you're having a conversation for possibility and some people are trying to pin things down to specific actions, often it, it actually puts a limitation on the possibility. It puts a limitation on your ability to brainstorm. Um, I found this out the hard way. I, uh, the, my previous business partner I was mentioning was very much a conversation for action orientation. Very practical, very detailed, very structured. Um, and I'm more naturally someone who has conversations for possibility, like where could this go, what could this be? Um, and we had to kind of learn how to work together with that because it, it can be a very potent conversation uh, as long as you know which kind of conversation you're having. And people who are very oriented towards action, you almost have to take them out of the workplace, sit them down with a, you know, a cup of coffee, a glass of wine, um, and put them in a different space for them to be able to have a more open uh, blue sky kind of conversation. Um, and I... Similarly, I've had situations where employees have left a conversation with me feeling a little bit flustered because I've been brainstorming some of the ideas that we could have in the company next year. And they think that that brainstorm is actually me instructing them to go and carry out certain actions. Um, whereas actually for me, it was, just a, it was just a brainstorm. It was just a let's talk about where things could go in the future. Um, so you, it's just worth being clear with people. Um, what context you're in. The last one here is a conversation for relationship. You know, we all probably know the importance of quality time, whether with colleagues or family. And there are certain conversations um, that really purely should be about just deepening your relationship, where there's not a particular outcome. It's not necessarily having a, a blue sky conversation. Uh, it's just purely um, building the relationship. In Daniel Goleman terms, you know, I mentioned the book Primal Leadership, he would call that affiliative leadership. Affiliative leadership is checking in with people, showing that you care about them, taking an interest in themselves intrinsically, not instrumentally because you want them to be a better employee or colleague, but you're intrinsically interested in them because they're another human being and you value them. Um, so setting aside enough time with colleagues, co-workers, reports, so that you can actually just have conversations that just deepen your understanding and acknowledgement of one another, um, I'd say is generally a good thing. Any questions on that? Does that make sense? Hi, Sophie. Yes. Mm. Well, I think the first thing is to name it. Because um, I think just bringing awareness to, hey, here's what I think is going on here. 
Um, I think the second thing is to try and, if you can, deal with that uh, upstream, which is to say whoever's responsible for calling the meeting, putting the agenda together, creating the frame, um, needs to put their attention on that so that people come and, and they're clear, uh, you know, they're clear what they're doing. Um, and uh, I think probably thirdly, it's just having a language around it. You know, if ever, it's a bit like Edward de Bono used to have these six colored hats. I don't know if you came across that, but it was like, a, oh, we're having a green hat conversation and that means that no one can say anything critical. Um, just the, the power of intention and the, the power of people having the shared language to say, oh, I think you're looking to have a conversation for action. I thought we we're in a conversation for possibility. It, you know, that, that allows that situation to resolve much easier than if people don't like, have any access to, uh, to that language. Um, and I think Um, I think that's a good, that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I think the answer to that is, um, uh, if, is, as long as people are clear, that's what you're doing, then maybe, um, and I, but I'd probably sequence them. It's generally better, obviously, if you have the possibility first and then the, the action second. Um, but I, I think that they can also be such different sort of flavors, um, people don't always find it easy just to kind of pivot from one to the other. It's almost like the, the one that's non-native to you, I think you almost have to sink into for a while um, for it to, to kind of show up um, more confidently for you. Um, the other way of thinking about those two things in, in different language, which you may or may not have come across, is uh, divergent and convergent thinking. So, Okay. Got it. Yeah, yeah, and in, uh, in Myers Briggs terms, it's very similar than uh, the last letter of a Myers Briggs profile, P and J. You know, basically the extent to which you like to open things up and stay uh, open to new perceptions, or the extent to which you like to kind of close things down and have things settled and uh, decided. And uh, I guess what I've kind of realized, I think, only in the last couple of years, is that yeah, there's a dynamic relationship between those two things. And I think some of the best leaders are able to do both of those things. They they'll have a native preference, but they value the other one enough that it shows up strongly. Thank you. All right. Uh, how are we doing on time, Sharon? Okay. So, because uh, uh, I'm, I'm not kind of committed to getting all the way through these, I'm happy to, to kind of see how far we get. Uh, I've, I'm now on the slide US perspective. Okay. Um, well, the first thing I'll say about the US perspective is... Uh, that you, uh, I found out this this week. I cl killed my first black widow spider, um, so uh, part part of the uh, U.S. perspective is uh, just being aware of a whole <laughs> set of things that uh, don't tend to come on your radar in the U.K., uh, like the bears that uh, decided to attack our garage last week as well. Um, so this first slide here is about both, or the first point is about both and thinking versus either or thinking. Um, without getting too much into kind of developmental theory, uh, it seems fairly robustly argued that uh, both and thinking is a, is a kind of up leveling of, of cognitive complexity from either or thinking, which as a leader, we should be interested in because the, again, the more complexity that we're able to cope with in a world that is increasingly uh, gray, uh, the more we, we are able to respond to things like ambiguity, um, paradox, and um, yeah, just the challenges of operating in a very fluid networked global environment. Um, so uh, I, one of the things I originally studied was politics as an interest of mine so I'm going to kind of explain this point with politics um, so in most countries in the world obviously you have a left wing and right wing perspective and uh, a both and perspective on uh, politics says well if we're mature about this we can acknowledge there are some things that people with a right wing perspective probably have right or that there, there's some value in that perspective which, for example, to say, you know, encouraging people to take responsibility for their lives is generally a good thing. Um, or encouraging government to have the, um, the most uh, limited role that it can or, or you know, not overly encroaching on people's individual freedom is probably a good thing. And on the flip side, we can say, well, the left wing perspective, which says that, you know, the reason that someone's homeless is not just because they're lazy and lack res personal responsibility is because they also operate within a social system, which may not be completely fair. That seems to be a valid perspective. 
So both and thinking kind of is able to is able to hold those things together rather than it being, hey, you know, you're across the other way from me. You know, if we were in Parliament and I need to kind of like put your arguments down in order to reinforce my position, um, we can both have aspects of truth. Uh, the, the mantra that's used in, in because this is one of the aspects of integral thinking, the mantra that's used is, is true but partial. And true but partial basically says no one is either bright enough or stupid enough to be 100% right or 100% wrong. So most people have aspects to, to some elements of truth, um, but their perspective is partial. No one sees everything and no one sees everything in, you know, in, a, in 100% of it. So both and thinking allows you to kind of cherry pick the things that are good from a whole different you know, variety of thinkings um, and uh, you know, allow them to coexist alongside each other. So I think it creates for a more, um, it creates for a more rich, uh, more dialogic or dialogical way of uh, existing. Um, it's you know it's a similar thing from a spiritual perspective. You know if we're in either or world, kind of like either I'm right and kind of like my religion has it right or my atheism has it right or vice versa. Uh, from a both and perspective, uh, we can say that you have aspects of some truth and I have aspects of some truth, and those things can can kind of exist alongside each other. Um, so it's a more uh, reflexive, it's a more nuanced way of uh, operating uh, in the world. Does that make sense? Yeah. Second point here, there's lots of interest in the US in this idea of raising consciousness. Um, consciousness is a fairly uh, you know, nebulous term. It's, it's used in a variety of contexts. Um, but some of the contexts that people you know, mean by raising consciousness is that they've uh, they've got an interest in people improving their connection with the world around them. Um, so we know that it's a developmental achievement for people to have more interest in uh, in the earth around them, in the sustainability of the earth, in the green agenda, in um, treating the earth as some kind of living organism, as opposed to treating it as something to be plundered, exploited, or, or used for our own ends. Um, so one way that people are interested in raising consciousness is in, in, in raising consciousness around um, the living system called Earth that we, we live in. Um, lots of interest here in raising consciousness around food. Um, I just had my sister over from the UK for, for, from Norwich for three weeks, and she's gluten-free, has been for the best part of a decade. And uh, she was amazed at the, uh, the ease with which you can be in somewhere like Boulder, and uh, you know, nearly every restaurant will have a gluten-free menu, no problems. Um, and in some in some instances, it's almost gone so far that it's kind of like the default option might even be a, a gluten free thing. But there's a lot of interest in catering for all sorts of diets, um, and uh, you know people just being increasingly aware of what it is that they put into their bodies. Um, you know, obviously the whole kind of organic movement is very strong over here, um, and to some extent. Um, you know, people even, even Whole Foods, for example, is a massive food chain. It's got its its headquartered in Austin, but has most most of uh, its biggest stores they've got are here in Boulder. Um, you know, people are increasingly interested. That, you know, when you say organic, what does that really mean? Um, there's been a whole kind of scandal going on about people sourcing organic foods in China that doesn't have verifiable third party standards for or organic stuff. Um, so, yeah, pe just people raising their their consciousness around what it is that they actually put into their bodies and how they treat their bodies um social awareness is a part of raising consciousness you know again it seems to be there seems to be a predictable trend that from entrepreneurship towards a more social form of entrepreneurship so from an entrepreneurship that is very focused on profit alone to an entrepreneurship that's focused on triple bottom line um or some aspect of making the world a better place and it seems that once people have kind of made that shift to being more interested in that social aspect it, it doesn't seem that people tend to go back so it seems to be that it's a kind of it's a new platform of development where people see the world in a different way and they see that both profit and purpose for example uh, are important um i think if you'd gone back you know you know, even 30 years that would have been a harder argument for people to accept that there are you know there are more reasons for being in business than making money um Raising consciousness is also part of um, people's uh, spiritual perspective. Um, one of the things that I've listed here in the resources is a book called The Road Less Traveled by M. Scott Peck. And uh, one of the things that he describes very clearly in that book is, are stages of people's faith journeys. 
And um, as someone who grew up in a very atheist family and was basically atheist through my early 20s, it was really interesting to me to notice that he was he kind of plots atheism as a very predictable stage of development. Um, and from his perspective, atheism comes after a more traditional approach to religion, a more um, kind of evangelical or right-wrong approach to religion. And that oftentimes when people... You know, it's kind of like the whole enlightenment was you know, the rise of science and people looking at the world in a different way. Um, and then when people have an atheist perspective, they tend to see everything that's re spiritual and religious as superstition. Um, and that was very much my perspective for a long time. Richard Dawkins would probably be the leading proponent of this. Um, and then it seems to be on the other side of that, if, if M. Scott Peck has it right, that people develop a more personalized, nuanced form of spiritual connection, whatever form that takes. Um, and rather than it being a sort of set of dictates that people live their life by, it seems that their spiritual experience, and you can see this was the rise of yoga and meditation and Tai Chi and Qigong and a whole load of other things that now sort of sit in the spiritual space, um, that uh, people have a more personal and felt experience of something that's bigger than themselves, however they particularly experience that. Um, and you can start to see that coming into the business area over here where um, it's, it seems okay for a certain proportion of business leaders to talk about being more conscious, being more conscious of um, you know, the impact that we have, being more conscious of um, the, 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 the way that our business reflects our deepest beliefs about uh, kind of like who we are on earth and what our, what our role is. Um, there's a whole movement around conscious capitalism. Um, John Mackey, who's the CEO of Whole Foods, um, I think there's a, I think there's about six Whole Foods now in, in the UK. There's a big one in uh, Kensington and London, um, but they're all over the US. It's one of the fastest growing businesses here. Um, he's been very involved in this uh, this movement to um, kind of unite more sort of wholesome and spiritual principles with you know a capitalist approach to doing business. Um, so there's a segment of the population I describe it here called spiritual but not religious. Uh, again, very fast growing proportion of the population. Um, huge numbers of them here in Boulder in the Bay Area. It you know, amazes me in Boulder that you can um, you can have a conversation with someone about um, you know awareness or the, the the sort of deep connectivity, the, the things that quantum physics are now showing up with, like string theory, that there's a deep connectivity between all things. Um, that's a very kind of well held idea here. Um, whereas I, I've definitely moved in a lot of environments where people would say that sounds very kooky, that sounds very um, strange. Um, so I guess I'm just highlighting that because I feel like the, the, the next expression of business beyond the kind of social orientation will also have some more kind of conscious or spiritual uh, aspect to it. We have to obviously be careful with language because what one person means by conscious is very different than the next person. So I'd say consciousness is, is really an essentially contested concept. Um, big focus on mindfulness and presence. Um, uh, Jonathan Fields, JonathanFields.com. He's a you know he's a top blogger in the U.S. Uh, writes a lot about entrepreneurship. Teaches people how to uh, get their first book in the world. Um, but is also a very um, you know well confessed meditator. Um, Google uh, have meditation classes that they're running. Um, one of their associates just wrote a book called Search Inside Yourself. Um, so a lot of the tech companies seem very open to um, the importance of people taking time to, to get still and really notice what is going on for them. Um, and as a leader, I think I put that down here as the number one meta skill. Um, the presence, um, being just super aware of what is around you and what is going on inside you, like what your emotions are saying or what intelligence you're getting from your body. Um, that is a huge leadership skill, um, not one that I think has a, a huge uh, emphasis in most leadership development. Um, but uh, if you can start to, to not only sort of think and plan and strategize, but also be receptive to information that can come through you when you get still and you kind of quiet the mind, other information starts to drop into you. And again, that can sound kooky and spiritual. I think it often just means that when you get the, the mind quietened and you take the anxiety away or you take the sort of fearful future-oriented thinking away, you can actually just be much more in the moment. And uh, obviously, I think life has a certain um, 
a certain intelligence to it that you can start to tune into more. So as leaders become more present, they need to have fewer pat pre-prepared answers and they can they can start to trust more in what um, you know they feel and experience in the moment uh, IWAH the identify with all humanity index um, this is one uh, this is one way that we can point to uh, an evolutionary perspective on life which is to say uh, that even though you know we live in a time of global potential global crisis and a lot of actual global crisis um, many of us forget that this is the best that we've ever had it. You know, if you look on a whole series of indices, and this is just one, which is really the morality index, um, the proportion of people who identify with all humanity grows uh, predictably every year. And and what that means is, you know, if um, if we're from different countries, um, that we are, you know, of different religions, different ethnicities, different sexual orientations. Uh, you are still equally worthy of my moral concern as someone who is exactly from the same tribe as me. And obviously you don't have to go that far back in history. You don't have to go that far back in history for um, it. You know, as one of my gay friends in Boulder was saying, you know, when I grew up, you know, if I mentioned that in the wrong place, I'd get a beating. Um, thankfully, we now mostly live in a world in the Western world where that, that's not the case. Um, similarly, you know, obviously England and France spent most of their history going to war with one another. Now, uh, for the last 70 years at least that that seems to have been a fairly uh, stable situation so the the more people look at other people purely as people and not from an ethnocentric or a nation centric perspective um the more it seems we have a, a we're living in a global village that we have a global consciousness and eventually you know if people are really interested in some form of global peace or global prosperity um I, that's going to be much more easily come by when people uh, are kind of more blind to uh, differences of, of nation and uh, ethnicity. So the general idea is that people's circle of moral concern expands over time. It's predictable. There are these set stages and it moves from an, an ethnocentric identification with the tribe, which basically means if you're from another tribe, um, you're probably not worthy of my moral concern. You only have to watch uh, Game of Thrones to uh, understand that concept. Um, it, mo it moves from an ethnocentric perspective to a nation-centric perspective where anyone who's part of my nation is worthy of my moral concern, eventually through to uh, you know, identify with all humanity or a global uh, morality which says that you know, human beings are human beings and however poor, rich, however um, developed or not, uh, everyone is equally worthy of my moral concern. Um, so I put that in there because it, it, I've probably explained it in a slightly theoretical way, but it's a, very, uh, it's a thing that makes it, me feel very optimistic. Because as, uh, as we move into an age of, of true global consciousness, um, for people who are really interested in global social justice, global prosperity, global peace, um, a, a lot more is possible off the, the back of um, more people identifying with all humanity. Um, last point here about um, emergence. Um, I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, um, but I've noticed a number of leadership conferences, one that I've actually been involved in a bit this weekend, um, who are they're very interested in emergent or what they call co-emergent spaces what what happens in the here and now um in a way that we we can't necessarily uh we can't necessarily predict um and it means as a leader being it's like the orientation moves much more from a directing uh perspective so a directive leader is like hey you know i'm charismatic or i have the vision and i need to kind of like influence other people in order to make that vision happen a much more emergent perspective is I'm, I'm the leader. I need to listen more deeply. I need to tune in more deeply to what wants to happen in this situation. Not what I want to happen, but what does what wants to happen itself. What does life want to happen? What is emergent here? What has the, uh, you know, the kind of benevolent force of life running through it? And um, it's a slightly different orientation. Another way to think about that is to notice that there is a polarity. Uh, by polarity, I just mean... Uh, uh, two interdependent opposites um, that we could both uh, value. So we can both direct our experience and say, hey, this is what's going to happen. Or we can allow our experience and say, hey, what's happening within me? Uh, both those things have value. We tend to natively prefer one over the other. Historically, leadership has preferred directive capacities. And when people think of a strong leader, they often think of a directive leader. Um, but the ability to allow and to um, go into the unknown and to foster collaborative spaces where you're not exactly sure of the outcome can be hugely uh, entrepreneurial. 
um, you know, the, loads of the tech companies in Boulder will have these hack fests where they just invite people to come along, you know, and just see see what they can create in an in an evening, and and there's no set agenda. Um, so as a leader, we need to be aware of both those things. Obviously, if you if you go too much into the allowing. It's a bit like the convergent divergent. If you go too much into the allowing and you don't direct enough, um, then life starts to probably lack a bit of structure. Um, but but noticing that both of those things are important is a is a huge leadership development in my experience. Um, and from my own my own perspective of the personal growth space, it kind of it, it's the bridge between the Tony Robbins empowerment, which is much more in the directing energy. Hey, what do you want? How can we make it happen? What's getting in the way? How is your fear holding you back? And the allowing energy, which is much more of the kind of new age, um, kind of you know meditative, contemplative, um, uh, you know, kind of like instead of asking the question "What do I want from life?" the question becomes "What does life want from you?" Um, and I think it's potentially a more profound way to be in the world. Um, and it kind of loops back to the what I was talking about with the coaching. You know, it's one thing as a coach to try and help your client get their outcomes. Like I want to make more money or I want to lose weight or I want to have a promotion or do a new job. Um, that orientation is different than having your client say, well, what does the world really want from you? You know, if there's something that's unique that could, could come through you or that there's a reason why you are here in this time, what would that be? Um, so allowing stuff to kind of flow through us when we get quiet is a really powerful um, piece of the jigsaw. So I'm going to pause there. I've talked a lot. Hi, Claire. Yes. Yes. Mm. Yes. Yes. Well, thanks for the question. Um, so I think one aspect to that is there's a question actually I was talking about when I had my, my sister over recently is, um, you know, it's partly like what value do you place on being in a social surround which allows you to feel like you're fully seen? Um, so for me, being able to come to somewhere like Boulder just feels like there's a higher proportion of the conversations and relationships I have where I think people kind of basically get me. You know, they get that I'm an entrepreneurial guy. They get that I have kind of like a vision for social change and they get that I have uh, some kind of commitment to, you know, inner work or spiritual inquiry or you know some kind of deeper reflective capacities. And I don't kind of have to justify it. It's just sort of assumed. And um, so for... I don't know where that longer term leaves me. I feel like it's been really useful for me to be in that kind of container for a, a while because I feel like it's allowed me to deepen into um, some of um, some of myself. Um, you're absolutely right that you have to be politically savvy with this stuff. Um, one of the things that's been really useful for me is to get an understanding of spiral dynamics, um, which is something I describe actually in the next... Um, uh, maybe I could just flick that up very quickly. Uh yeah, it's actually two on. It's development tool, tool, spiral dynamics. Um, and uh, this, um, you know, yeah, I mean, this warrants a lot more than just a kind of two-minute treatment. But the, the general idea of spiral dynamics is that individuals and cultures evolve according to predictable developmental stages, predictable levels over time. So it basically says, you know, we now are quite different than Stone Age man. We're quite different than uh, kind of Middle Age man or woman we're also different from um like 18th 19th century and that's not just you know because we have greater technology it's it's that actually what we put our attention on what we value and our way of being in the world is different um and what this gives in a fairly kind of scientific way is um 
it just gives you a perspective on how those memes develop. And at the times where you might feel like people are not receptive to a, you know, say the, the message of Deepak Chopra, what this can provide is just a, a general sense that, well, over time, this it, it seems like culture and individuals do evolve. It seems like they take on more inclusive perspectives, inc perspectives, you know, more morally inclusive, as I've previously described, but eventually also more politically inclusive um, and uh, you know, hopefully also more spiritually inclusive where, you know, you're a Buddhist, I'm a Christian or whatever the thing is, that's completely cool rather than it being antagonistic. So it's like if you take the long view, things do get better. Uh, as one of my friends said the other day, what would the Pharaoh of India give to have one light bulb, you know, let alone an iPhone? Um, so, you know, obviously technologically things advance and we notice that, um, but it does seem like the consciousness also advances around it. Um, finding the right language can be important. So, um, you know, presence and mindfulness has kind of got some acceptability in in business and corporate. You know, it may be more so in the U.S. than in the U.K. Um, but that doesn't have to that doesn't really have to be a spiritual thing. It just can say, hey, you're super busy. It, it, take time to slow down and notice that when you do, you feel less stressed. Um, there's some great work being done on the field effects of meditation. You know, get a thousand people to meditate in the same area. They've done this in D.C. They've done it in Lebanon. And uh, the crime rate goes down. Um, so you can kind of use, um, you can use the fact that in this perspective here, this uh, orange level is the dominant consciousness probably in most of the Western world. Orange values science. Orange values um, achievement. It values democracy. It values rule of law. Um, so if you can use the sort of language of science it's why you know neuroscience is really useful for people who want to make a case about meditation because they can they can talk about it from a scientific perspective and not just a kind of karma sutra perspective um so so finding the so finding the leverage points and the language points that, that really work within the dominant culture um is definitely important um and i think the other thing that's really important is that at this green level which is the new age stuff the deepak chopra stuff that you're talking about um it's also being able to see the pros and cons of that. Oftentimes when people get to a green level of development, they kind of think that it's the, the be all and end all. And they look at people who are in big business and they basically see them as evil. You know, people who are very into the sustainability agenda tend to look at big business and think, yeah, you guys just seriously don't get it. And, and they, they forget that most of, uh, most of Western world prosperity is built upon the engine of orange capitalism. It's built upon orange big business. So even if you're a you know, tree-hugging person, um, ultimately the fact that you can, you, know, you can live in a culture that has a pretty good uh, prosperity and is pretty safe and all those things, that's the kind of achievement that we don't want to throw out of the window. And this sort of idea that we can all sit around, hold hands, and one day everyone in the world will wake up um, I, I take kind of like direct issue with that. I don't, I don't think it's um, grounded in the reality of how life works. Um, so being able to point to the shortcomings of the kind of uh, new age worldview, I think is really important. You know, I, I just say to people quite bluntly, I say, you know, if, um, if you're so spiritual that you can't pay your rent, that, that's not a form of spirituality that interests me. Um, if you're so spiritual that you can't influence people in, in mainstream culture, um, you know, there's a role for that, but it's not really, it's not the kind of dominant expression that, that I'm interested in. Um, but the, this meme perspective allows you to, um, allows you to kind of see this big picture, where things are going, have an optimism that they're going in a good direction. Um, and part of the integral developmental perspective is to take each of these spiral dynamics or meme levels and become comfortable with them and integrate them in yourself. Um, so if I, um, if I have uh, an issue with the kind of right and wrong fundamentalist religion, um, I can say that's not, a, that's not a, a worldview that I want to subscribe to, but I can acknowledge that for some people, having a very clear sense of right and wrong given to them from a uh, charismatic religious figure on a Sunday, that can actually be a better way of them being in the world than if they didn't have it. You know, oftentimes that kind of religion helps people clean up their act. You know, it helps them go from, you know, I don't know, dependence on alcohol to dependence on God. And that's probably a good thing. So this this kind of allows you to see the, the whole developmental arc. And, um, uh, you know, ultimately all those stages are necessary. You know, you if you think about, you know, I studied a little bit of childhood cognitive development, you know, um, Kohlberg and, and Piaget talked about these stages of cognitive development in a child you know a 10 year old experiences the world differently than a toddler you can't judge a toddler by a 10 year old worldview that's not to say that 
all green worldviews are, are kind of like more advanced than orange ones, but it's the general direction of evolution. They all have something important in the picture, and the more that we can have them coexist in their healthy expression, that's how we you know look after the overall spiral. You know, so as someone who's interested in politics, I think that's the the prime directive of politics is to try and bring all these things into um, into their healthy expression rather than their less healthy expression. So. Capitalism can be conscious, healthy expression, or cat capitalism can be exploitative of people in the third world, unhealthy expression. Whereas people who just look at capitalism and say it's a bad thing, they kind of miss that nuance. So, long answer. <laughs> yeah. Um, my strong encouragement is just give it a go. Um, I uh, was always really resistant to typologies because I feel like I'm a fairly broad person and I don't like people putting me in a box. So I was even initially pretty like Myers-Briggs. I was like, oh, I don't know about that. Then I, when you meet people who actually understand these things at a more nuanced level, you can start to see their power. I think the Enneagram is a hugely accurate typology system for what really goes on inside people. Um, so if you're interested in being um, more... Uh, kind of present or more of the essential qualities of who you are, um, you could start to look at, at the personality as uh, less fixed. So rather than I am X kind of person, you start to see, oh, I habitually show up as this kind of person. Is that the fullness of who I am? And I think the Enneagram can be really useful to developing uh, self-awareness, developing compassion for self and for others, and, and generally anything that makes people more aware and compassionate, I think of as a good thing. Um, I had a very powerful experience of a, a working relationship that wasn't working so well, and uh, looked at the seven, Enneagram seven and Enneagram eight uh, type dynamics, and I was like, wow, it really accurately describes what's going on. Um, and it starts to make you realize that you know, we inhabit very different worlds depending upon our types. And like all uh, typology systems, hold it lightly. It's not the whole truth. If you start to live into it too much, you, you're kind of limiting your experience. Um, but noticing that you know, some people spend a lot of time in the future uh, anxious about what might happen. Some people spend a lot of time emoting on the past. Um, other people are oriented towards a more theoretical expression. Some people aren't. Uh, it just adds richness to uh, your understanding of yourself and uh, other people. And ultimately, if you are someone who's interested in um, uh, a sort of non-denominational spiritual journey to say, uh, what is the fundamental, like, essential quality of me beyond a habitual orientation of my personality or uh, attention, um, the Enneagram is a, is a really, uh, really profound system. It seems to date back to 10,000 BC in ancient Egypt, um, has been rediscovered in, in the sort of 60s and 70s and mapped onto psychology. Um, so it's one of these psycho-spiritual syntheses. And I think, again, in the spiritual space, you will see uh, increasingly emerging psycho-spiritual syntheses, things that take the best of neuroscience and psychology and graft it onto uh, what we call the perennial philosophy or the sort of the truth that seems to run across all spiritual traditions. So dig into it. Thank you. I would love to do that. Yeah, I should should be in the spring. Thank you. Well, thank, thanks for having me and good luck for the rest of your journeys together. You're welcome. Bye-bye.